Many people ask me on Instagram or during workshops if I have a recommendation for a light, cheap and sharp telephoto lens for a bird or in general wildlife photography. And my answer is always that this is tricky and it's hard to find a recommendation that kind of ticks all the boxes because most of the lenses that are long and sharp, they tend to be also expensive and heavy. However, a bit earlier this year, I had the chance to test the RF 100 to 400 from Canon for several weeks. And this lens completely changed my mind. Unfortunately, I don't have it here anymore since I had to return it to Canon, but I was really putting it through its paces and it performed so well that I actually made some really unfair comparison to my big EF 600 mm F4 lens, which uh, yeah might surprise you, I think. So if this sounds interesting to you, then keep watching and I will mention all the different points of the lens and also some downsides that I noticed. One, if not the most important aspect of an entry-level telephoto lens is of course the price. And I think here the RF 100-400 really yeah, stands out. It costs around 700 euros or 600 US dollars, which is really, I think, a really, really fair price. And it's also a very light lens. Um, it comes in at 635 grams, which translates to 1.4 pounds. And this is not only interesting for those that are maybe not willing to carry a big telephoto lens. I need to say that even I enjoyed it having a really lightweight and short combo that was well balanced. Um, you can see here a clip when I was taking some pictures of the Eider ducks in backlit. And the problem was I could not get really low to the water surface. So what I actually needed to do is lower my camera and shoot with the flip out screen and this would have been just impossible with my EF 600 mm f4. So here I really valued the lightweight of the 100 to 400. The lens is equipped with image stabilization. The filter thread in front is 67 millimeters. I tend not to use this so much on telephoto lenses. However, if I do landscapes, sometimes I might throw a polarizer filter there or maybe an ND filter for making the clouds move a bit more. However, as I just said for bird photography, I rarely use one. The minimum focus distance is only 88 centimeters, which is amazing for some macro um, shootings. Maybe not for really small insects, but if you just want to take some pictures of flowers, dragonflies, maybe even damselflies or butterflies, uh, it's really nice because with 400 millimeters you can keep a bit more distance to the animals. And I was also using it for some amphibians and the results were really nice. And again, I was quite happy about the lightweight in these kind of awkward positions that are really annoying to hold. The lens has basically three switches. On one side there is the lock unlock. So for locking the zoom into 100 millimeter that it's not accidentally um, extending. I was actually never using this one. I prefer something that I have, like I have it on the 100 to 500 where I can uh, smooth or tighten how easy I can move the zoom ring. But this locking, yeah, I didn't like it so much. Um, there is also the AF MF switch and IS on off. So you don't have like different image stabilization options. And also for the AF, you don't have a focus limiter. And I really wish it would have one because in some situations with mirrorless cameras, we all know this, the camera is getting is stuck on the background. It's not able to focus on the perch or something. And I think here a focus limiter would have been really helpful, even though I need to say, here the 100 to 500 is also not helping because the focus limiter is either full or three to infinity but nothing like um, the closest which in the 100 to 400 would be 88 centimeters to i don't know eight meters but what i found really disappointing is that canon is not including a lens hood when shipping this lens and i know it's not an l series lens but at least with the telephoto lenses, I always use a lens hood. It's just sometimes I'm going a bit through the bushes, through grass, uh, whatever, I'm taking pictures on rocks. And I just have the feeling the lens hood is giving me a really nice layer of protection. And if I would buy this lens, I would definitely order the lens hood as well. But for me, it's just a pity that this is not included. 
So let's move to another really important factor and that is image quality. So how was it? In one word, outstanding. I did not expect this for a zoom lens with this price point. Um, you can see here some pictures that I took from some ducks in a local park. And even if we zoom in quite a bit, there is still so many details, everything looks sharp. Um, I don't think my EF 600 millimeters would really have performed better here. And I was so surprised that I decided to throw in the two times extender and took some more images. And you can see this, the quality is still holding up really well. We see some degradation. I will talk a bit more about this later, but overall I was quite amazed. Now I need to say I took uh, images in various conditions and I had the feeling that the lens was performing best when I was shooting on a relatively short distance. If the birds were a bit farther away, it was losing a bit in sharpness. Uh, you can see the quality is still very nice, but there my 600 millimeter definitely had the edge. Also quite important for sharp images is the autofocus. And here it also performed quite well. Uh, it was acquiring focus much faster than my 600 millimeter f4. Uh, it was amazing how fast it basically jumped from the minimum focus distance to infinity and back. So again, no issues here. I was also taking several pictures in backlit situations. And here sometimes the focus was hunting a bit more, not really able to acquire focus. But in the end, in most cases I managed and I also need to say that this is uh, like a difficult situation for all lenses. So also with my 600 millimeter or with the 100 to 500 in backlit, it, it's always a bit trickier to really acquire the focus. The lens also comes with image stabilization. As I said, you cannot do, choose between different modes. It's either on off, but this was not a big issue for me. And I think most beginners will not really use the panning mode so much anyway. And here again, you can see in this clip, the moment I turn on the image stabilization, you really see how it's kicking in. This is certainly nice for photography, even nicer if you do video. And in general, this lens was quite nice for video. It was tracking birds in flight perfectly and allowing me to smoothly follow them. So for the image stabilizer in general, it was clearly better than my EF 600 mm f4, which was also to be expected. And I would say slightly worse than the RF 100 to 500, but not terrible if I was shooting like with uh, a 50th of a second at 400 millimeters. I think around two thirds or so were sharp. It's a bit always tricky what you define as tech sharp, how, hand, how easy you can hand, hand hold and so on. But I hope it still gives you a rough idea. So let's address the elephant in the room. If you extend it to 400 millimeters, you're at f8 maximum. And this is of course not a bright lens anymore. Is this a problem or not? Well, I would say it depends. First of all, here it's really unfair to compare it to a 600 millimeter f4. The 600 millimeter, at least in Switzerland, is costing around 20 times as much. Uh, it's way heavier and it's also quite bulky to carry around. So that's not a fair comparison at all. Nevertheless, I took some images and you can clearly see that here that the 600 millimeter is providing really smooth and nice backgrounds. Whereas on the 100 to 400, we see a bit that the houses in the background get distracting. However, I need to say if the ducks were moving a bit to the right, you can see we still can still see the background, but now that the background is a bit nicer, I think it's not so distracting anymore. So I took some more tests at my bird feeder, which is kind of a more controlled situation because of course I put the branches and everything in a way that there is a sufficient distance to the background, that the background is in general aesthetically pleasing. And here I think it looks really fine. Of course we can still see some structures in the background, but for me this looks fine and I would say most beginners would be happy with it too. However, I would keep in mind that with f8, even during the day, you need a bit higher ISOs. And if you shoot a lot in twilight situations, the, high, the ISO get really high and yeah, it's, it's feasible, but you just need to live with a bit more of noise. And I would maybe invest a bit more in the post-production to reduce the noise with some software like Topaz Denoise or something similar. I was mentioning before that I want to say some more things about the teleconverter and this is also coming here with this f8 if you put a teleconverter you get an f16 lens and now you lose two more stops of uh, light so if before you were already at 1600 iso now you're at 6400 iso so it's getting really dark 
I had no problem looking through the viewfinder. It still looked everything bright enough and quite smooth and so on. But just the image quality will suffer in terms of noise. Uh, and I think the degradation we see in image quality, it's, as I said, not big, but the bit that we see, I think it's less due to the, let's say, problems of a teleconverter and the lens, but more to, due to diffraction. Uh, F16 on a 45 megapixel camera, we start to see the diffraction. And speaking of not so much light, of course the sensor gets less light also for the autofocus to work with. So we have a bit of smaller area that we can move the focus points around. The autofocus will be slower. So you can already see I was not the biggest fan of the teleconverter on this lens. Um, also because the teleconverter itself is costing almost the same price as the lens. If you already have a two-point teleconverter laying around at home, fine, use it. Uh, at least in some situations, but I think most people have and then I would really not recommend investing one for this lens. So what's my conclusion? Well, if you're rather a beginner, maybe you have a 55 to 200 or a 75 to 300 millimeter telephoto lens, you want a bit more reach, really nice quality, but still in a lightweight and quite cheap package, then I think the RF 100 to 400 is really the lens for you. At least if you want to be versatile. If you are taking more pictures of shyer birds that are, and small birds that are far away, and you don't need necessarily need a zoom. I would also have a look at the RF 800 millimeter lens. Um, I think I will also do a review about this soonish. So definitely subscribe to the channel and not activate all notifications so that you will be informed when this is released. Um, I was testing this lens a year ago for I think around a month, and it also offers very nice sharpness. And if you compare the RF 100 to 400 with a two times extender to the RF 800 um, F11, you actually have one stop more light on the RF 800, which gives you, of course, better image quality in terms of the noise. And furthermore, it helps with blurring the background a bit more. And speaking of background, if you want to have nicer background rendering, you still want a zoom lens that has this versatility, maybe you say 400 is also a bit short for you and you're ready to invest a bit more, then I would really take the step up and go for the RF 100 to 500. I already did a review of this one. You will see it in a few seconds appearing in this corner. And even though I could not test this combination so far, I think now with the R7 and R10, this could be really interesting to pair it with the RF 100 to 400 millimeter lens because you get a quite affordable and balanced package. Usually I would not recommend to buy an RF 100 to 400 to save money and then also buy an R5 that is quite expensive. For me, it makes more sense to, um, how should I say, invest the money a bit more evenly distributed in camera and lens, but this is just me. And finally, I would also invest a tiny bit of money in the post-production. Some people like the DxO Bureau um, software. Personally, I prefer the Topos Denoise. Um, there's a 30 days free trial that you can download. I put a link below. It's an affiliate link. So if you decide to buy one because you really like it and it helps you with your photography, if you use my link, I just get a small provision, which of course helps me to do these videos. So that's it. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Bye.